Hello, everyone. Thank you for your support of Southwest Wings. I'm Kathy Anderson. I have been uh, with Southwest Wings as a field guide and, and presenter for many years, and I'm glad to do it again. Today, we're going to have a very quick um, review of flycatchers. Let me share my screen, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, there we are. Um, flycatchers is a huge family. It is the largest family of birds in the world. There are a lot of different kinds of ducks and owls and warblers and things like that, but flycatchers is the biggest family in the world. Thankfully, we don't have all three to 400 of them here in the United States, and we um, hardly have either one of these, which would make flycatcher identification really easy. That's a scissor tail flycatcher on the left that does show up in uh, Texas. And that is a uh, Atlantic Royal flycatcher um, on, on the right there. That you have to go to South America to see. Okay, we'll talk, uh, while this slide is up, we'll talk a little bit about flycatchers generally. They are um, uh, quite visible birds to see. They're not skulky as a general rule. Oftentimes they sit high on a shrub or a tree um, and on the exterior so that they can uh, sally out and catch uh, bugs. Uh, so that makes them um, kind of nice to see and try to identify. Uh, their colors in the United States aren't, aren't quite this dramatic oftentimes. Um, they are more black and gray and white and beige and yellow, but there are some distinctions that I hope will um, help, help you uh, be able to identify flycatchers. Uh, if you saw a flycatcher from underneath, and you can often see a flycatcher from underneath, um, you will see that their bill is kind of triangular shaped, very pointy at the end and then more triangular as it um, attaches to the bird's head. Uh, if you're in a quiet place and the flycatchers are out, um, you can actually hear them snap their bills shut. Um, and that's, that's kind of amazing as they, as they catch um, little flying creatures on the wing. Uh, a lot of them are crested, not as dramatically as this um, uh, royal flycatcher on the right, but have some sort of little um, minor crest, uh, nothing like a, uh, a cardinal, but it give, gives the head a little, little squarish look. Uh, they have rictal bristles, almost all of them. Those are specialized feathers around the bill. Uh, there is a theory that that helps them catch uh, the bugs in the air. Um, maybe they act as uh, whiskers, uh, as a sensor, but more likely they are protecting the bird's uh, eyes um, when a, a bug is um, snapped in two and little pieces fly apart uh, in, in front of the, the flycatcher's face. Uh, mostly the sexes are exactly alike, uh, except for the vermilion flycatcher. And from there, we will go on to uh, the flycatcher family in general. Okay, so the flycatcher family is divided into uh, several uh, genera, and those are the Latin names there over on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, we'll go through the most common ones in each of these genera. Some of them are um, limited to one uh, bird, the vermilion flycatcher, uh, pyrocephalus there. But most of them have some um, confusing cousins. The silky flycatcher, the phanopepla on the far right of this particular screen, um, is, is not in the flycatcher family, the tyrant flycatcher family. It's, it's in its own little bitty family of only about five members. But because it has some of the same attributes as flycatchers, and it is a fairly common bird in Arizona, uh, I thought I'd include it in this review. So from the left to right, we've got a Western Wood Peewee, a Vermilion flycatcher, a Cassin's Kingbird, uh, probably a Cordilleran flycatcher. That's one in the Empidnix family, those horribly confusing little guys. Uh, the next one is a Myarchus, but that, that is not one of the rusty-tailed jobs. It is a dusky flycatcher, and you can tell because its tail is not rusty. It is more the brown color of the, of the bird generally. And then far to the right, the Phenopepla. All right, ready? We're going to go through this pretty quickly. 
All right, the Cantopus genus, uh, the peewees. And of the peewees that we're going to talk uh, mostly about, it's the one in the middle, the uh, western wood peewee. That is an olive-sided flycatcher on the left. Wouldn't you know that it's not even called a peewee? That makes it a little bit more difficult to remember. And that is a greater peewee on the right. But the western wood peewee is a very common uh, flycatcher that you can see. And one of its best behavioral uh, attributes is it virtually always comes back to the same perch at least a couple of times in a row before it moves on. And that, that makes it um, easy to see. Uh, and even if it whisks away, it comes back and you can see it again. It is uh, something that helps identify it because a lot of flycatchers don't do that. Um, it's uh, not too big, maybe six, seven inches long, grayish. All the, um, uh, the Cantopus flycatchers have a little vested look. That is, it's got, looks like it's wearing a vest with the shirt underneath uh, showing through. And that shows on this um, slide. We don't have time today to listen to all our birds, but uh, I have links in this uh, presentation to uh, All About Birds and you know, or the Audubon website where you can listen to these different sounds. And certainly if you're going to be in a place where the flycatchers are, listening to their sounds is, is gonna help you uh, sort them out. All right. We have three easy ones in a row. Uh, the two Phoebes that we have here in Arizona and then the vermilion flycatcher is pretty easy as well. First one is a black Phoebe. This one will always be near water. Uh, this is a, <laughs> it needs riparian area. Um, pretty much anywhere you're near water, this guy will be there. Um, it's black and, and white. He looks very formally dressed. Uh, the, feet, the youngsters will have a little bit of of a um, uh, buffy wing bar or brownish wing bar, but mostly they're just black and white. And they sally out and grab insects. Um, you, you can see them in family groups as the nesting uh, cycle uh, completes itself. Um, there'll be three or four together, but this is a pretty easy bird to see and, and a lot of fun to watch just because it is very cooperative. A uh, cousin to that one is the sage phoebe. It's a little bit bigger, about seven and a half inches, um, and uh, sh shaped in a little bit more crusty look to it than the um, black phoebe. It uh, has a grayish brownish back, a uh, black tail, and it's it's um, kind of uh, peach colored uh, on its underbelly there. This is a bird that does not need water. This is a bird that often is in the very, in dry lands. It never perches very high. It often perches maybe three to five feet off the ground and stays low and sallies out and um, across fields and meadows and um, wetlands and things like that. It can be found in, in wet areas, but it, it is uh, the bird of the, the desert, the flycatcher of the desert, uh, pretty much year round. Um, some of them are here, but you can see this guy makes a pretty long journey right up into Alaska, northern Canada. Um, pretty remarkable. Lots of bugs up there for anybody who's visited Alaska in, in the summer. And the last of the three easy ones, a vermilion flycatcher. There's the male on the left and the female in the middle. Um, this is a bird that's all over not South America and Central America. Um, it's very common. Uh, the male it has been studied to indicate that it spends about 90% of, of its time perched, usually pretty high. So a uh, red light bulb at the top of a tree is usually a vermilion flycatcher here in the West. The female is a little bit harder to tell. She's beautiful in her own right. She's got some fine streaking on her chest. And again, that kind of peachy underbelly um, and, uh, and a hint of the same kind of black mask that he has. The babies will be look like the female, except that their under parts, instead of being peachy, will be kind of lemony yellow. Um, and they're, they're beautiful in their own right as well. Basic behavior, uh, same for flycatchers, sally out, grab a bug, come back. But this one, um, again, is, is more uh, uh, evident near, near water. Um, it doesn't, not quite so much to the degree of, of the black um, 
Phoebe, but this guy will be often near water. But it kind of mixes both um, the water and the in the meadowy or, or field-like habitat that sits low oftentimes like the Sage Phoebe. Let's look at the Sage Phoebe and the uh, female Vermand flycatcher together. And you can kind of uh, start thinking about how different they look. Look at the, the difference in the size of the bills. Uh, the Sage Phoebe has a more elongated look. It is a bigger bird, doesn't have um, any facial pattern that, that stands out pretty well on that, that female vermilion flycatcher. All right, now we're getting into the tricky ones. Okay, this is the Tyrannus genus. Um, that's the kingbird genus. We have uh, at least four kingbirds that you can find in Arizona, but I uh, am highlighting only two of them today. The one on the left is the western kingbird, and the one on the right is the Cassin's kingbird. Um, the one on the left is mostly found in the more southern areas of, of uh, Arizona, except for the higher elevations, and then that's where you see the, the uh, Cassin's kingbirds. And as you go into more northern Arizona, you're going to find more Cassin's kingbirds as well. So these are uh, look a lot alike. These two pictures dramatically help. Identification is not quite as easy in the field as it is uh, trying to pick out a good picture to identify these birds. But one thing that I always look for, um, you can see that the Cassin's head is quite dark. It's dark gray, and that dark gray does go down onto its chest. Not so much the uh, Western Kingbird, that's pretty pale. Both of them have that kind of mustache look, um, a little white mustache under the bill there. But on the Cassin's Kingbird, that really pops out. And on the Western Kingbird, it kind of blends in with the lighter chest. The other thing that people look for in the field is um, the white outer tail feathers of the Western Kingbird. The Cassin's Kingbird, unfortunately, if you look, whoops, there's the Western Kingbird up close in its, in its range. But I wanna show you on the Cassin's Kingbird, which is the um, also on the top left photo, the outer white outer tail feathers can look white if the light is behind them. So don't look just for that, look for that darker head. You can tell this is a Cassin's Kingbird on the right photo just because that white mustache still stands out. Cassin's Kingbird also has a white tip to its tail, but the white tip um, can get worn and, and not look very white in flight. So look, look at, at the head um, to try to identify these two. All right, this is the tough genus, um, the Epidnex genus. Um, a lot of people have a stronger word for friggin in the middle. Uh, these are called empids by birders. Um, and oftentimes they go on our lists as empid species because they are really difficult. Even, even um, really good birders will argue about which of the empid species we're looking at. Um, they will be comparing eye rings, they'll be comparing bills, um, they'll be comparing the uh, primary projection. That's the very bottom part of the wing. You can see how the primary feathers, those are the ones that are the longest at the end when the, the wing is stretched out. <clears throat> they can look very long and they can look not so long. And it, depending on the bird and how long it, it migrates, those primary projections can be um, past the secondaries, which are kind of the squared off feathers, um, particularly on that middle photo, uh, can, can help. But these, these guys are tough. Uh, so what I think we have here is a gray flycatcher off to the left. That's a pretty easy one only because of its behavior. It is the only bird of the empets that um, dips its tail. If the empet is going to use uh, its tail for expression, it often raises its tail or wags it around a little bit, but the gray flycatcher will dip its tail and it's unique in that way. Uh, the middle bird is either a Pacific Slope or a Cordilleran or Cordilleran, depending on how you want to pronounce that, that word. Uh, flycatcher, it's got the um, more teardrop eye ring, if you will. That's a bird that uh, scientists have decided whether to split them or lump them or split them or lump them. They keep going back and forth between the two. Um, I'd rather they lump them and make it much easier for us. 
Uh, it's good to know if you, uh, by following sort of eBird charts, um, bar, bar graphs, um, when, when these guys are coming through Arizona. The, the Pacific Slopes tends to be earlier uh, than the Cordilleran. So that if you're seeing Pacific Slope, then um, that's, uh, and early on, then that's probably what you're seeing as opposed to the Cordilleran. Another, another difference that you can look for um, amongst these birds, although I won't go into it today, is some of them will um, molt before they migrate and others will molt after they migrate, particularly in the fall. Um, so that if you have a bright bird in the fall, you've got uh, the bird that molts before it migrates. If you have a very dull, washed out um, bird that looks like it's had a very busy breeding season, um, that bird is, migrating, is molting after migration. And that helps um, distinguish these as well. But they're tough. They're, I, I, yeah, they're tough. What can I say? And, and the one on the right, I believe, is a Hammond's flycatcher. But yeah, it's really tough. So look, here's our gray flycatcher. Don't have a video of him wagging his tail downward. But now you know that, that if you do see a, a flycatcher wagging its tail downward, most it is a gray flycatcher. Most of the time, this is a pretty gray bird. Um, uh, but I have seen it with a yellowish kind of wash on it as well. So it's not, you can't go by the color on this one. Um, but that behavior is, is helpful. Uh, this one shows up in a lot of different habitats. Um, and Mid to, high, mid to lower elevation, it's, it, it can winter in the, in the Phoenix area as well as down the Tucson area, as, as you can see from the map. Um, so the habitat's harder to tell on this one. Here's a Cordilleran flycatcher. Um, as I say, it's a lookalike to the Pacific Slope flycatcher. I think they're virtually impossible to tell apart. You're supposed to be able to tell them by their song. I don't hear them sing because I'm not in where they, they breed. I'm in the Phoenix metro area. They're a high elevation bird. You can hear them singing up in the, in the higher elevations of Prescott, Payson, uh, and Flagstaff. So um, listen to those, those uh, recordings before you go out, depending on where you're, you're headed. The Cordilleran is, is, is one that you'll find here in Arizona. The Pacific Slope passes through and is more of a coastal bird. Okay, and there's Hammonds. Okay, um, you can see the primary projection from the underneath on this, this particular photo, something to look at, but I think it's really, really tough to figure out. Um, this is kind of a little guy. Um, you know, they're all kind of little. They're between five and six inches, most of them. Uh, look at the bill color for this one. This looks to me like it has a teardrop eye ring, but not quite so dramatic as, as uh, Cordillera and Pacific Slope. So that helps a little bit. Again, uh, voice will help. This is a high elevation bird, um, blows right on through Arizona uh, to get to higher latitudes as well. But this is one that you can see in high elevations uh, as, it, as it comes through Arizona. Uh, also, also in lower elevations, because they don't always hit a mountain on, the, on their migratory route. All right, Myarchus genus. This is a, a, a mid-sized flycatcher. These guys are a little bit bigger, uh, seven and a half, eight and a half inches. And these are the two common ones in Arizona. On the left there is the um, Ashwater flycatcher, and on the right is the um, brown crested flycatcher. I think, yeah, the ash flycatcher. flycatcher. Uh, look at the size of the bill. Uh, that, that will help. And mostly ash-throated is a good name for this guy. He's pretty whitish and uh, oftentimes has a little bit more yellow than this photo shows. But um, otherwise, uh, he, he is um, a bird of the desert. Um, and when you have this, this bird and this one, the brown crested flycatcher, look at the bill on that one. You can, and it, by large, a lot more yellow. These birds do overlap in habitat, but because the uh, ash-throated flycatcher is smaller and sl more slender than the brown-crested flycatcher, it tends to be um, more comfortable in the more desert type of habitat, whereas the brown-crested almost needs a riparian habitat. And that's because the vegetation in the riparian habitat is, um, is larger. 
Both of these are cavity nesters. Uh, so the asteroid flycatcher it can uh, find cavities in the desert and the smaller trees uh, that will be perfectly suitable, but the brown crested flycatcher uh, needs the bigger cavities that might be in a cottonwood or a sycamore. Um, and this is a, this kind of a specialty Arizona bird. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it doesn't seem to be as well studied as, as the ash thrower there because the ash thrower uh, range is, is so much broader. But it's, it's a cool bird. Uh, listen to the voices. I think they're pretty similar, but maybe you can, you can puzzle them out yourself. Um, and last but not least, uh, from the silky flycatcher family, I'm not even going to try to work off, out that particular family name, um, is our Fana Pepla. Uh, Fana Pepla is an interesting bird in that it has two um, uh, places where it nests. It nests first in the desert and then goes to mid elevations to nest again. It's the only bird that I know of that has a, a nesting uh, in two entirely different habitats. Uh, it's very crusty looking. Some people call it the black cardinal. It is a slighter, more slender bird than, than a cardinal, but about the same length, a little bit shorter. Uh, you don't even know it's got white wing patches until it flies, and both the male and the female have the white wing patches. You can see that in the little photo. Uh, the females are not so dramatic because she is gray and um, uh, doesn't show the white wing patches uh, as much. Uh, this is, the bird has a red eye, but if you want to impress your birder friends, you can tell of them that the immature, which will look like the female, uh, gray, has a dark eye. So when you're pointing out the Fana Pepla in your area, you can say, oh, that's a juvenile Fana Pepla, um, and people will be very much impressed. Okay, that wraps up a very quick uh, review of flycatchers in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, thanks again for supporting uh, Southwest Wings, and I hope I'll see you in the field someday. Goodbye.